Bueno, pues, buenos días, bienvenidos eh, a este seminario del Departamento de Oceanografía Física de CICES. Uh, mi nombre es Alejandro Arias, yo soy investigador postdoctoral y en esta, por esta ocasión voy a presentar uh, en nombre de la doctora Paulina Rubio, que tuvo una emergencia y, y es un gusto en esta ocasión presentar a la doctora Heidi, Heidi Dirsen. Ella es investigadora de la Universidad de Connecticut. Uh, Uh, hice mi doctorado en la Universidad de Connecticut. Cuando yo hice mi doctorado, ella se, se incorporó al Departamento de Ciencias Marinas de la Universidad de Connecticut. Uh, bueno, voy a presentar brevemente a la doctora. La doctora Dirsen es, profe, es, la doctora Dirsen es profesor and head of the Coastal Ocean Laboratory for Optics and Remote Sensing Colors, jointly appointed in the Departments of Marine Science and Geography at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Dixon received her PA, her Bachelor in Science and Master in Science degrees from Stanford University and her PhD from the University of California in Santa Barbara. And was a postdoctoral fellow at Small's Landing Laborator Marine Laboratory and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute prior to assuming her present position at the University of Connecticut. She is an optical oceanographer who specializes in developing and using ocean color imagery and data to understand the ecological and air sea processes, including coral reef, seagrass, and full algal blooms, white caps, and marine plastics. She is presently team leader for the NASA Plankton Aerosol Cloud and Ocean Ecosystem PACE. This mission was launched in January and recently in 2024. She also serves as an aquatic science member of, the, of NASA Surface Biology and Geology Mission. She is a Fulbright Scholar and she works in developing methods and technology for in hyperspectral remote sensing with colleagues from in Belgium. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alejandro, for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, this is the best we can do. So I'm hoping to take you on a little journey. Obviously, I have attempted to publish on every topic possible. And today I'm talking to you about uh, marine plastics because it seems to be a common theme. But before that, I just wanted to note he mentioned i came from all these different places and i i love this these different images uh because you can completely see why i study ocean color uh from the deep blues of the california current to the university of miami's sort of aqua blue uh, calcareous sediment uh, now i'm here in this building where alejandro also studied uh, my, my office is on the 2nd floor looking out at this also very beautiful, uh, long Island sound. Um, so my lab, as he said, is called colors and I have a lot of research projects and I'll just show you briefly. Uh, the ones that I'm currently funded to work on, which include this project that I'm talking to you today called scoop. Uh, we're also doing benthic mapping. Uh, we're doing a big project in the Antarctic on phytoplankton and sea ice and climate. I work in ocean worlds off planet and also some optics and acoustics. So you have to invite me back uh, at least six times for six more talks. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's disturbing because I'm the only one that can hear my jokes and laugh at them. Um, anyhow, uh, I'm obviously the pace science and applications team leader, which was this giant 10 years of my life. And thankfully, the mission launched. This is the launch from Cape Canaveral. It was very exciting to see in person. It went up on a SpaceX and it's uh, just been through its commissioning phase and everything is looking really good. So if I can get to that, I'll tell you a little bit more about PACE. Uh, here's some members of my team that I've been working with for a while on various projects. Um, and just acknowledge them. So I want to just jump right in. I know most of you probably have heard some talks on ocean color remote sensing, but maybe not on radiative transfer. So uh, I just want to say we published this kind of fun paper with Susan Mendendoyer, who's a, a zooplankton person. That's what these little copepods are here. 
And one of her students made this great graphic. So we have these satellites up. We have the sun that makes our measurement passive. The beams down on the ocean, and we even made the index of refraction. So you can see light bends as it enters the ocean and leaves the ocean. And we're trying to get at phytoplankton, gelp stuff, which is the colored matter, sediment, all things I've published on. Um, and then now we're adding, you know, elements like plastics, floating, sea floors. I've looked at many things, but what I wanted to think about is what's missing from this, which is going to be the key to looking at plastics from space. And what's missing, if, if I was in the room, I would point to one of you and you would say, Heidi, what is missing? Is the atmosphere and the ocean surface, this beautiful wavy surface. In fact, when we do ocean color remote sensing, more than 97% of the signal it comes from scattering in the atmosphere and reflections off the sea surface, uh, especially in certain wave bands. And as most of you know, sea surfaces are never flat. Uh, we all get seasick at some point, me in particular. Uh, and radiative transfer is quite complex after uh, over a wavy surface. So what we're doing when we're trying to get this photon here from under the water back through the surface is really uh, like magic, pulling a needle, as we say, out of a haystack of noise. Now, people who study the atmosphere like that, it's predominantly atmospheric noise. Um, but also, if you look at this, uh, you know, even just this is from one of the colleagues on this grant, one of their radiative transfer models includes all these various streams of multiple scattered light off of different sea surface slopes so that we can better understand what if you litter the sea surface with little bits of white plastic, for example. So we have to we have to come at this from a fundamentally uh, radiative transfer perspective where most of what we're seeing is the atmosphere. And I'm going to give you a spoiler, what we call a spoiler alert, which means, you know, the truth is, if we do have bits of plastic, they're going to look a lot like an aerosol uh, in the atmosphere, not as something floating necessarily on the sea floor, sea surface. All right, so this is um, 101 radiative transfer, but this black line might be what the sea surface looks like with reflections. And then we go up in the air, and of course, you all know that the beautiful blue marble is blue because of the atmosphere, not because of the ocean. The atmosphere is scattering this a tremendous amount of blue light um, and is providing most of the signal. You're going to see some spectral plots here going from 300 nanometers to 1,000 in my talk. Just want to point out that UV is less than 400 ultraviolet. We have our beautiful visible spectrum tuned to our eyes and also phytoplankton enjoy this visible spectrum. And then we have the near infrared and then the, the short wave infrared out to 2500. Um, now, if we break this down further and oh, if we just take a look at this 3000 meter now, if I say satellites like PACE are 675,000 meters out. 675 kilometers. They're way up here outside the, so we do most of our modeling to something called TOA, top of atmosphere. Um, but in this next, just to keep everything on one scale, we're using 3000 meters just to show you an example. If you had your sensor there, like at an aircraft, um, you would have the red line. Most of that comes from the atmosphere. Uh, this red line is surface reflections off of that sea surface, and the green line is this water leaving. And what you'll note is it's almost zero to zero out, out in the near infrared to the short wave because water absorbs those bands so highly. So unless you're in a river plume that's filled with sediment, this is always uh, nearly zero except if you have little plastics littering the sea surface. So think about this for a moment. This is why I'm starting with this theoretical thought, talk. And we had the opportunity as part of our NASA grant to have an artist visual photographer. 
and he took some brilliant pictures. The first one was sort of more of the plastics and floating things, but these were the ones that were sort of informative if you're trying to do plastics from space. I sent this one along and you're, what is this? This is light coming through a bridge reflecting off a wavy sea surface. And these little flecks of light are what we call sun glint. Um, and you can see as from space, these types of little glinty flecks could possibly look like plastics. And here's this beautiful velvety sea surface also filled with sun glint. And here's how each little bit of glint actually looks. So it's very dynamic because we don't think of the sea surfaces with our eyes, uh, but it's, it's wonderful to work with an artist who can help us kind of formulate our models and start to think about what would plastics floating on the sea surface look like given there's, if you're in the glint, you have all these little bits of reflected glint. And then of course, we also have white foam and you all study open ocean processes and white caps is something I've studied before too. And you can see that they're also a little bit white. So you've got foam, you've got glint, and you've got plastics. How do we differentiate and understand? Um, and you'll know this is kind of cool because in our models, we say that white cap doesn't have sun glint because it's um, because of the matrix of the bubbles. And indeed the photography does uh, validate the fact that you have these patches of foam, but the glint happens outside the foam. So uh, we had a brilliant art exhibit. Uh, we've done it twice. So if you want us to come down to cease and show our art, we're very happy to do that as well. Um, so I'm hoping I can convince you that sea surfaces are quite complex. I've published on many of these things that kind of mess up the standard image of our oceans. And now, oh, here we go. Let me see if I can minimize this a little bit. <clears throat> and now we want to see uh, debris here. So here, here we have it. How to detect plastic debris from sea spray. We have dust, we have foam, we have bubbles, ice, clouds, surfactants, glint. We have a very complex sea surface and uh, all in that I'm trying to see some little bits of plastic debris. So how much plastic do we have? So our work is focused on what we call microplastics. Um, they've been observed or modeled in all five of the subtropical gyres. And you all know that Ekman transport causes these large convergence zones. So uh, we have anything that's buoyant, which plastic is generally less dense than water. It floats on the sea surface. Uh, and so here we have what we call the Great Pacific garbage patch here, but indeed we have patches of plastics in all of the ocean gyres. Now this is modeled by Le Breton and it peaks at about, uh, you know, 10 to the seventh projected pieces number per kilometer squared. Um, this is the field studies, much uh, less than what we have with the model, but it largely follows the modeled projections. We have high amounts, possibly 10 to greater than 10 to the sixth in these various gyres. Um, there's been quite a bit of data, but you can imagine if we could get a satellite product, you know, to do the whole world instantaneously, that would be pretty tremendous because we could model to see how our efforts to control uh, plastics are uh, are working in the long term for monitoring. So if we could fill in all this white data here with something from a satellite, wouldn't that be great? And imagine if there's a million little bits of plastic in every kilometer squared, shouldn't we be able to see this? So this is the subject of my talk today. And mostly we're focusing on microplastics, which are less than five millimeters in size. Um, Macroplastics generally larger, uh, similar, but a little bit different from these little bits are the ones that make it all the way out to the middle of the gyres. Um, and we think their concentrations are increasing just because plastic is increasing, but that's complex. 
Um, we have the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We call it GPGP in some of these plots. Within that patch, for example, this is the field data suggesting that the amount is increasing over time. Our satellite record roughly from 90, 1998 to present, you know, maybe we could track some increases in and around this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So stay tuned because um, that's where we're going to hopefully go at the end of the talk. So my main two questions here are going to revolve around one, how do microplastics influence the spectral reflectance or essentially the color of the ocean across wavelengths? And how can we detect these microplastics with ocean color remote sensing? And we really have to consider that we have this highly dynamic scattering, absorbing atmosphere and the sea surface reflection. So I'm going to incorporate that into our models as well. So I started in this field. My postdoc, Shungu Garaba, is kind of a major player in this because he saw my one of my grants. I was looking at things that mess up atmosphere correction. And I said marine debris, and he got very excited. Let's do plastic studies. So this is one of the first uh, spectral studies we published in 2018, 2017, the database. And we went to the Mystic Aquarium. We took a spectrometer, and there was this exhibit on mac macroplastics made into art objects that were harvested from beaches. So these were natural objects that people found of various colors, shapes, sizes. And we went and we measured their spectral properties. So this is the visible wavelength here, this first bit. And you can see that's all over the place because these are colored plastics. So sometimes it peaks in the blue, a blue plastic, sometimes in the red, sometimes it's violet, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it's very white, sometimes it's quite black. You know, the colors of these plastics is obviously variable with what you would see those plastics to be. But you can see there's some peaks here in certain bands that we sort of identify. These are pretty unique regions of the spectrum that plastics, uh, their electrons rotate in certain ways that make this specific to plastic. Now, how does the macro, now that's, you know, anything dumped in the ocean that floats up on the beach, but what about the bits that make it as you know, very far out, like into that Great Pacific garbage patch. So he went and he got a whole bunch of samples. Oh, and this is some recent work. And I wanna say that while this looks like similar bands, we did some clustering on the whole world database of plastics. And we basically have a couple different types that of absorption bands uh, in the near infrared and the short wave. Um, there's this uh, one we call type one, that's polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC. And then we have these type two that are slightly shifted to the blue wavelengths. So these are 1215 and 1730 around there. And these ones are more at the 1130 and 1160 and 1600. So slightly shifted is the PET bottles. Those are the standard water bottles. PMMA, which is what you would plastic bags, and those things have slightly different features. Um, so what does a spectra of plastics look like in the open ocean? So we had a bunch of samples sent to us. We sized them by millimeter scale. It looks like a basically a pile of dust. <laughs> um, and here they are. And look at that for a moment. This was surprising to me because we went from the macroplastics and we suddenly went to these microplastics and no matter what size, shape, they suddenly had a very consistent, we call this an end member. They look much more consistent than I had anticipated anything out there would. And in fact, they have single peaks here uh, and they have this more white spectral shape, I would say, uh, sort of a grayish shape, which means they probably get bleached by the sun. And so this was pretty shocking. I said, wow, we can model this really easy. Once it makes it out into those gyres, it's a very consistent uh, spectral shape. And then we went and we 
took a whole bunch of raw plastics from the Institute of Material Science, and we took spectra of those, and we tried to match this plastic to that. And we found out it was most similar to the PVCs, PMMAs, and polypropylenes, uh, uh, that the type one, as I said, this type one style plastic with pretty consistent band features here at 1215 and 730. Um, okay, so here we have our end member. We're super, super psyched. We can go ahead and start, uh, you know, using this to look for plastics. We know what they look like, except, hmm, <laughs> we're like, what's missing? And if I was in the audience now, I know someone would be raising their hand. What's missing? Guess what? Natural biofilms are missing. And we don't actually know what they really look like because those were dried and stored. So we had the opportunity to send my master's graduate student, Graham Trolley, out with the C semester, who's been doing much of those field sampling as an educational experience for the last few decades. He went uh, from Hawaii here along this trek up and this trek across. This is the modeled patch of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and then back into San Diego. This area is, has 94% of the estimated 2 trillion tons, uh, two on, uh, sorry, 2 trillion counts of floating pieces, uh, nearly a million pieces per kilometer squared when you get into it, which if we look at is about a fractional coverage of uh, Oh, 0.002% of a pixel. It seems like a lot, but actually this is gonna be key to our discussion. When you put a million pieces littered over a square kilometer, it turns out that it's actually much less concentrated than those big red dots on the map seem to suggest. Okay, so uh, you all know that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch looks like this. This is it, the Great Pacific Patch reported to be twice the size of Texas, filled with garbage. Okay, obviously this is like Manila Harbor or somewhere. It is not the open ocean. In fact, this is Graham on his cruise. It's a lot of blue, 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 blue ocean across this convergence zone. Um, and this is the net that they use to collect these plastic pieces in. So here it is. It is a, a sample collection uh, nearly daily. This is a new stun net tow that they've been using since the 80s across the whole world ocean and they've been counting plastics. And here you can see is a bucket after one of these toes. Um, so you can see it's a, a grueling thing to actually measure. So that's why there's not that many measurements. The net has to be partially above the sea surface and partially to, uh, below to get the floating bits. And then once he got those floating bits, he immediately took a spectral measurement of them wet. He removed the biofilm and stored and filtered through a 0.7 micron filter. Then he took a spectra of the cleaned microplastic, and then he saved it, sent it home, similar to what our initial studies were on for the dry reflectance measurements. And then we did some microbiome sequencing because we were kind of curious, like what is the biofilm on these samples? Here's a filter pad. You can see there was a bit of green on those samples. Um, and so just to say how much did they find and are they increasing exponentially? This dot is their cruise they did in 2012, also across this patch. And you can see in 2012, they generally found more plastics than we did in 2022, which is here. Um, and in fact, keep this dot in mind. I'm going to show you this on one of the later plots. It's 10 to the seventh pieces. This is the highest ever recorded in this area of microplastics. Uh, but what we can also say, there was a big tsunami in 2011. So perhaps this higher concentration, we have to be careful with saying there's exponential increase because there are event-driven increases in plastics, as we know. Uh, 
Of note, what was on it, I know you're mostly physical oceanographers, but it's kind of cool. These green bars across the whole, all the samples across this whole region. The highest was a red algae called Tsunamia, which was actually very recently discovered after the tsunami in 2011. We don't know if it's always been there, but nobody had looked. But clearly this red algae is the one that is doing the most work. Is there a problem with my connection? I can turn off my uh, slides. Let me see. I'll stop sharing. Are you having problems with my connection? I'll turn off my video. Okay. I will keep going if everyone can hear me. We can hear you just fine. Yes, we oh, can okay. hear you. Oh, good. Okay, so this is what he found. And so you are used to seeing these spectra now. Here's the biofilmed, here's the clean. He did a lot of hardworking student. And then this is the dried when we came home. And you can start to see pretty consistent from what we found before. If we look at this dry and we compare it to the dry I showed you that Shungu and I took uh, in 2018, they were actually exactly the same. So. One thing we know is what's reaching it to those central gyres is very consistent in composition and shape, size, and amount of uh, actual bleaching of those bits. So that gave us uh, more knowledge. But what we did find is the biofilmed microplastics obviously were absorbing light in the blue. And this peak here is uh, chlorophyll, fluorescent, uh, chlorophyll absorption. So they were absorbing quite a bit of blue light absorption by algae. And if we invert that to look at not light reflected, but the difference as light absorbed, it's clearly absorbing a lot of blue light and it's absorbing at chlorophyll reflectance here. It's not making much difference here, here, not so much to the band depth, but there is a little bit of heating uh, difference with the biofilm, but it's not impacting. I'll show you in a moment the actual amount of absorption there. Uh, so this is similar to I've done a lot of work on snow algae. So this is quite similar absorption. To, we find red snow algae to this red tsunami algae, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then we wanted to know if we did develop a sensor in the future that looks at some of these specific bands. Uh, how would the biofilm affect that? And what we found is the band depth, that's the depth of these features here and here and here, um, did not actually change in the short wave, the near infrared, tiny bit at 931, but we actually don't use this because it's very similar to water vapor. And then uh, clearly a big difference at the chlorophyll absorption. So biofilms are absorbing, they look like phytoplankton. Oh, no. So how do we detect microplastics with ocean color remote sensing? Let's move on to that quickly. First, we simulate fractions of plastics. This is water, obviously not reflecting out in the near infrared. And then we add these bright plastics. And then we say, uh oh, what's missing here? And you guys all know, I already said what's missing is a lot of things when we're in space, we have to the entire ocean and atmospheric scene composition of atmospheric aerosols, types of aerosols. We have the different spectral bands. We have viewing geometry, polarization, measurement certainties. These are all things we have to consider. The observation geometry, the seasonal swaths, spatial resolution, and then we have to figure out, is there a spectral signature that we can quantify? Um, so this is the, basically the the part of my research I've been doing over the last 20 years is trying to figure out how we can actually model these things. So in one way, we, we did over 130,000 simulations varying a whole bunch of things. We did at different wave bands here, and we looked at wind speed, aerosols, ocean chlorophyll of the water, plastic coverage. We did a lot of different solar zeniths. So these are all things that we have to consider when we're looking at how to retrieve things from space. And then we did uh, an information content to see if we could 
have a plastic detection probability. This is the fraction of the surface coverage required for at least a 95% probability of de detection in best case. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about how we did that. My colleague, Kurt Noblespees, did the information content. And if you've never done this before, it's a pretty useful way to take something that you observe. So there's a lot of observational uh, uncertainty and you map that into the state parameters of various parameters with uncertainty. Um, so you make a Jacobian matrix, which is the partial derivative of how this perturbations and observation affect perturbations in your observed parameter state. Um, and so we make models. So when we ran the models, we perturbed the models with different amounts of perturbations to look at uncertainties. And this is the uh, formulation of the Rogers method of information content assessment. And I have to say, this is the best case scenario. It represents that we know what the uncertainties are. So known um, perfect retrieval, if we can do this perfectly. So this is even just in the best case, um, Good for high dimensional cases and I can say if you're uh, so the basic details is for a given simulation. We have a Gaussian distribution of errors. We assume that the fraction greater than 0 is the probability that you can actually detect in the best case. A plastic um, and we calculate the probabilities for all the plastic concentrations for that set of uh, parameters and then we're able to say a 95% probability of detecting. And I, I wish I could explain it more, but I, I'm going to run out of time. So there's a GitHub code uh, if you're interested on information content that Kurt did in, with, in conjunction with this grant and it's all up on Noble SP if you're interested. So this is just one example of how our simulations work. And you can see that under some conditions, you can see these plastics in the idealized best case with less than 1% uh, plastic coverage. But in a lot of cases, you need several percent up to 10%. Uh, this left panel is sorted by aerosol optical depth, which is a me measure of how many aerosols. So you can see if you don't have a lot of aerosols, you can see the plastics better. So that makes sense with what you and I know. Um, this one is fine mode fraction. Uh, and this basically, if the, if the aerosols are really small, they tend to be man-made and very disruptive to scattering. So you're not as likely to see them when you have uh, a large fine mode fraction and you're more, uh, which is where you have the fine mode uh, fraction of 0.01. And then when you have small aerosol fine mode, meaning more coarse aerosols like sea spray and dust and things like that, you're more likely to see uh, these plastics, but still you have to have close to a percent or so to see it regularly. And then just briefly, how would this influence our atmospheric retrievals? Obviously, as we add plastic, if we have the aerosol retrieved, our ocean color is going to think that we have more aerosol optical depth. So we, we ran our uh, standard aerosol retrieval, and you can see that it thinks as you add plastics, the aerosol optical depth is going to go up. So if we're already seeing contamination of our ocean color imagery, we should be seeing it partially in this aerosol pool. We should see this aerosol retrieval going up over the Great, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is the spectral shape of the aerosols. Um, we should see that going down. Conversely, we just said they're biofilm. They look like phytoplankton. Oh no. Does this impact our long term historic chlorophyll record? Because as you add plastics with biofilm, they're going to look if they're biofilmed and even if they're clean, they had a little bit of blue absorption. So they're going to look like phytoplankton. So as plastics increase, we also predict chlorophyll will be increasing in the middle of these gyres. Uh, so these are some predictions. So then, uh, you know. 
this is the highest recorded ever. So this is just an example to show that in fact, thankfully, we're highest recorded and mostly we're down here and the very beginnings of an impact under best case scenario is starting to be an order of magnitude higher than we ever uh, have observed ever in our uh, history out in that great Pacific garbage patch. So that's good news so far. And then we wanted to say, but can we see these three predictions over time? We have 20 years of satellite. Do we see the aerosols increasing, angstrom decreasing, and chlorophyll increasing in this gyre associated with plastics? Perhaps we're getting more than we measure. Perhaps we can see a change in these regions. So this is my last bit. So can we see any long-term trends? in the MODIS 20 year time record associated with this last bit of increase in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, we focus on all months, but obviously over the Pacific, we have Asian dust aerosols that come blasting across in March, April, May. So this is not the time one would be ideally looking for change, maybe due to plastic, because it could be changed due to dust aerosols. So, we're going to focus on looking at June, July, August, which under low winds without a lot of white caps uh, on the ideal conditions to say over those months, over 20 years, are we seeing these consistent trends that would indicate increasing plastics? So I know there's going to be two very busy slides, but this is month by month, January, February, March, April, long term trend. And we have within. The garbage patch is the solid line and outside the garbage patch is the dotted line. Um, and this is our prediction of aerosol optical depth, which we think should be increasing in this patch within the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch over time. This is uh, month seven, so six, June, July, August, when we think the aerosols are lowest these are all on different scales, but in fact, they are lower here. And you can see, no, we see almost no trend to a slight decreasing trend. Very little indication that we're actually seeing increases in plastics that would be evident in this aerosol pool. Uh, if we look at both, this is a spatial graphs places over time where the aerosols go up and the angstrom goes down. It's kind of a melange of pixels, no matter what month you look at. There's no obvious trend that's showing us that this patch is doing anything differently over time. And in fact, angstrom under low winds is a little bit of a iffy parameter to begin with. But what about chlorophyll? Well, guess what? We predicted that if the plastics with the biofilm were increasing, we would see increasing chlorophyll in the gyre. And in fact, no matter what month you look at, guess what? The North Pacific gyre has decreasing phytoplankton biomass over the last two decades. Um, so that also has three lines of evidence that in fact corroborates our simulations that we are not seeing the impacts by the ocean color uh, by floating plastics on our ocean color signals at the present concentration. I showed you how we simulated that and we had to be much more concentrated. And I showed you that observations over the MODIS time series are not consistent with how we predict plastics would impact our retrievals uh, of both aerosols, aerosol, uh, angstrom, and chlorophyll over those patches that they must be at least 100 fold more concentrated. So we don't think they're even more concentrated than we've measured at presently with our field sampling. Um, and to detect routinely, they have to be at least over a percent fraction of pixel with our current technology. Okay, so what's missing from this is where are we gonna go next? Did we just nail it? We've done it all. We cannot do marine microplastics. They're too dilute. So we are going to go next is trying to evaluate more white targets like white caps, clouds, sea ice, pumice, other things that can actually also mimic plastics. 
and evaluate the capabilities with more spectral information, maybe focusing on those near infrared and shortwave features and looking at those band depths. Um, we're also looking at polarimetry, which I didn't get into today, but it will disrupt the polarimetric properties of the sea surface when we have bits of plastic and we're also modeling that. Um, and so that's that combined with these narrow band algorithms that may be a little more re robust and we with a suite of sensors or sensors with very high signal to noise we're going to try to say how uh, how much uh, capability would these sensors have to have to see plastics at the current concentrations uh, with some new algorithms that we are proposing particularly in this part of the spectrum all right, with that, I wanted to thank you. Um, and I will take any questions. Let me just see if I can get my. Let me see if I can. Oh, here it is. My photo back on here and see if I can see people. <laughs> I see you. OK, muy bien. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, puede eh, abrir su micrófono y hacer la pregunta, si es que tienen preguntas, ¿ok? Welcome, Daniel. I see your chat there. Okay, so in the meantime, I, I have a question. Um, yes. So, in, in, the, in the view of the results that you have about the the lack of of resolution to to see the difference in of the presence of in microplastics so yeah. what do you think it i mean i mean it's only that the algorithms are not the to write a specific to well i think it. that they look much like an aerosol so their uh their spectral shape is is increasing into the near infrared and our ability to differentiate that is very, very hard. Um, so there's that. Um, in fact, when they're biofilm, they look a little bit different from aerosols. So we're able to detect, detect them at lower concentrations than not biofilmed. Um, but I think at present, the fractional coverage, they're just so dilute that within the current design of any satellite at uh, polar orbiting that has that much atmosphere, they're just not detectable um, okay. yet. But there could be if we amplify and get a very, very high resolution at just a few bands. So uh, that's where we're going to go next. Generally, with ocean color, it they're just too too dilute and they look too much like the atmosphere. Okay, thank you. Sure. So if you look at this, this is a cloud and plastic. I just like this because you can sort of see these various features. Um, but you know, this little band here at nine thirty looks a lot like this one here in the cloud. This is water vapor. This is liquid water absorption is slightly shifted. And then this is sea ice solid water. So water absorbs pretty highly depending on the state in this 940. So that's why this band here of plastics is going to be very This one here is quite distinct from anything else that we have and uh, this drop here at 1600 is very strong. Mm -hmm. Nothing else looks like that. Okay, so there's sections that are really specific to detect the microplastics. Yeah, that we haven't really focused in on. Okay, that's fine. Uh, this a comment in the chat. They say if they have a questions for later, uh, how they can get in touch with you. Oh, yeah, sure. You can email me. Let me see. I'm going to stop this. Then I can get my chat up because right now I can't see it. Here, let me see. Oops. Show chat. There it is. Yeah, you definitely can email me. I'll put it in the chat here. <clears throat> So 
So, oh, the question is whether microplastics in the atmosphere. Yeah, that's going to be hard. So we're picking our best case, even microfibers. We're not looking at submerged microfibers. Those are pretty hard in the water. And right now in the atmosphere, um, I'm, I'm not, we could maybe, well, that, that would be a hard bet to try to detect fibers in the atmosphere, but it, it, it is something to think about. Um, now, for us, obviously, I'm looking at floating microplastics, which is just a tiny uh, amount of the plastics in the ocean. We know a lot of them have sunk to the seafloor um, where they probably should remain. Um, and there's a lot of talk on what it means to clean up the ocean in general uh, of plastics. Uh, when you see these large graphs where they have giant dots by weight, it's because there's these giant gill nets that collect the plastics and then they pull one of those out. And every time they pull one of those that's like collected a lot of pl plastics, it's very heavy. Um, and so it looks like there's more plastic than there is. And there's still questions on whether it's worth using fossil fuels to go get those nets. And then where do you put them? Because most countries won't let you actually transport your microplastics to landfills. Uh, so now you're, you're using fossil fuels to get these plastics, to pull them out to, to what does cleanup mean? It means moving it to a landfill somewhere where then again, it could potentially wash into the ocean or just be on land. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy with, with ocean cleanup. Um, so uh, there's a nice question here. Let's see. Uh, could you suggest any particular characteristics in plastic products? Well, um, yeah, so the interesting thing from my talk was that strangely, the little bits that actually are littering the sea surface, like these millions of little bits, um, are very consistent in, in the type. And they've shown that a lot of the plastics in general come from fishing. Um, I think these little bits end up, you know, they, they maybe get too biofouled and as there's turbulence, they leave the surface and they probably eventually sink. Um, I don't think any uh, particular characteristic except how, how they, the shape, the size, the type is very, consistent for what travels long distances. And that's, you know, more of the PVC type uh, plastics, the hard fracturing little bits of plastic. And they're also not spheres. We can't model them as spheres. They're sort of asymmetrical little disks, which is also very, you know, they're flatter. So they've been like fractured bits of plastic. Um, so they're, they also are not, not spherical. So um, yeah. I, I guess that's the, the things that come ashore on the beach are all over the board. Anything that comes out a river is much more diverse. You'll get plastic bags, plastic bottles, but surprisingly what makes it out into the middle of the ocean is much more consistent um, in, in type, I guess, and plastic product. That answers your question. <laughs> I mean, I know we're trying to make biodegradable bottles and plastics and things like that. Um, so. Okay, so um, it, is there any more questions? Like in, in anybody has any, another question that want to ask? Okay, uh, but you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat or, or you can email Haley and ask her directly. You can, I would love to hear it. And if you want to get some page data, we do have it. And uh, let me just show you some extra slides here that I, I just didn't want to go which over time too much, but I'll uh, show you the pace is, has a pretty big footprint and it's the first global hyperspectral satellite. Um, that's why it's a big, but it's looking at um, all these bands. So we're gonna have 
a ton more information across into the near infrared than we had before. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to see not just, you know, we probably won't be able to see these dilute plastics with these abilities, but there are some bands that we're hoping to look at that maybe might have a little more detection capabilities. Plus, there's a whole bunch of new things we're seeing that we couldn't model before, even in the first month of PACE. And then NASA is putting up Glimmer next, and this is going to be geostationary. Uh, it's also hyperspectral, but at 10 to 15 nanometers, so a little less, but it's going to be hourly across the Gulf of California, Gulf of Mexico, all along the U.S. And so this will be really exciting for your neighborhood. It's a, we call it geostationary. It's way out in orbit, so we can just stay looking at a certain part of Earth, like our weather satellites. Um, so it'll be the first hyperspectral that will be looking down um, the North American coast. Um, and then SBG launches in 2028, we think, and that one's going to be fully into the sphere. So this one may have more plastic detection capabilities at 30 meter resolution. So we might see finer scale patches of uh, convergence zones like Langmuir and other things that might have more of a signature we can look for uh, rather than the broad one kilometer scale of PACE. Um, and then these are the swaths. So what you can see is PACE is a big wide swath and one is ascending and one is descending. So that's why they have uh, different swath orientations. So SBG is 30 meters. So that's going to be a very small track going Every month or so, you might get a pixel from that, uh, a clear sky image. Uh, and then PACE is global pretty much every day at this wide swath. And then SBG is going to be looking a lot at these areas of the Gulf of Mexico. We don't have a box in the Gulf of California yet, but maybe we could ask. It should see these portions uh, regularly. Um, at near hourly or every two hours with the full ocean color sensor. So these are exciting. We're on the sort of the cusp of looking at the oceans in a whole new way. All right. Stop with that. Spatial resolution of pace is one kilometer, a little over, yeah. So it's global oceans and land at one kilometer. Daily, near daily. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, it's, it was a pleasure to have you with us. And yes, thank I you can, for inviting me. It was a pleasure yes. chatting. Yes, yes, it, it was really nice that you have the opportunity to talk with, with us. And uh, well, with that, I think we can do end up here and if anybody has any more questions you can email ID directly okay yes please do and thank you so much and uh, thank you in, in the name of the department of physical oceanography well thank you for having me and please keep in touch yeah sure